It's me. Yep. You want me to kick off? Yep, go for it, Greg. Okay, right. Uh, <laughs> first question, how many people listening today have got a bison nursery? Uh, nobody, but Pam's um, assisting some of the others that have got bison. Okay, nurseries. right. So that's going to be new stuff. I, I, yep, this is all I, new stuff. Yep. All new stuff. Yeah, okay. Right, well, I'm going to switch screen. Um, where is it? Oh, share screen. Oh. Okay, so we're talking about the spring active dung beetles today. Um, first one is Bubis bubalis. We just call it bubalis. And the second one is Anthropaga vacus. We call it vacca. So you guys are getting two bubalis nursery kits and seven vacca. Pretty good. Now, one of the most critical things to understand with dung beetles is their life cycle. And all the management actions relate to the life cycle. So this is probably one of the most important slides you'll be looking at today. So with bubalis, they emerge here in well, I'm Strathalbyn, South Australia. They emerge in early August. Uh, we, we've got a lot coming out now. And then the dark blue, they do their breeding period. And then here, they slow down pretty much at the end of December. There's a few stragglers that, that breed until the end of January. And then they're in the soil in what we call diapause until the following August. And then the whole cycle is repeated over again. So very simple, emerge, breed, diapause, emerge, breed, diapause. However, I can guarantee the timing will be different in your area. So we're gonna send those beetles to you next week and you could find because of your climate, I, I suspect they might even breed longer and you will find after a year or two that their emergence period will actually vary a lot. They've varied since I first got these beetles, they've varied, they've adapted to, to, South, to South, Alvin, South Australia and they've moved back basically two months. So that's where we're starting from, but it'll vary in your area. And it's something you need to take aware of, take, take note of is, is their, their activity times, because that's going to affect when you do management and when you do um, feeding, when you do uh, harvesting, and when they're eventually in the paddock, understanding the timing that they're active, it kind of determine when you're going to do, if you want to do a, a chemical drench or when you might move cattle to a paddock so that they're there for build food to get your population of breeding going. So there's a whole lot of reasons why this um, life cycle is important to understand. Now with VACA, it's basically similar, similar except for one difference. Here is emerge breed diapause. Um, here is emerge breed. And then the next generation comes out called the F1 generation in entomological terms. And that generation is the is the at the stage it goes into the diapause and then follow comes out the following year. So oh. here they're going in the diapause as uh, mature adults or larvae and pupae in the soil, and they come out there. But here they're actually developed and go into diapause as as feeding adults. It won't be in the brood ball. So this little phrase F1, I'm going to refer to that a lot. There's something we've got to remember and think about. That's the big difference between vacuum and bubalis is F1 generation in January, February. Now, the other thing to put in our heads is the nursery models that we use, because I'm going to refer to those all the time through this talk. Now, we have a SZ or LZ nursery, which looks like this. It simply stands for zincaloom and small and large. So because vacuum are a smaller beetle, they fit into the small Z, the small zincaloom, the SZ. Because bubalis are a larger beetle, we put those in an LZ. And then we also have this other nursery, because there's two nurseries in the kit. This is called a PP tent. PP stands for PVC pipe, because that's what's holding this up. And it's a tent with a zip in it. Um, and so we will be talking about initially setting up this nursery, the SZ, LZ nurseries. And then at harvest time, we put them into the PP tent. And I'll explain the reasons why, or in, in essence, there's two reasons. One is that, is that um, when you go from one tent to another, that's when you're counting beetles and that's therefore you're getting a measure of success of your breeding. 
And the other thing is, this is the tent where, where you'll have, it's bigger, you can have bigger numbers. And this is the tent that you actually do, you release in the paddock from. So the nursery system is designed around these two models, which we have to get familiar with, SZLZ and PP. So let's put those two things together, the beetle life cycle and the type of nursery. So this is the Bubalis Emerge Breed Diapause. And we're talking at around about now, or maybe in a couple, you know, early end of August, by the time you get yours, you set up your LZ nursery for your Bubalis. So we're gonna go through setting that up. And then from then until harvest, which is the following year, it's really, really simple. I mean, there's a few tricks to getting it right, but it's feeding it, feeding it there until it stops uh, using dung in January. And there's a few tips to managing the nursery, which have to go right through till they come up next year. So it's pretty simple, set it up, feed it. And there's a few little bit of management of water and weeds and things. Um, now, when they come out the next year, that's when your PP tent, you don't have to erect that tent until uh, August next year. That's when you harvest your beetles, put them in the, in the PP tent, feed them again and release them. Uh, so it's pretty simple. You don't have to think about much for the next few months. And you can review this video when you get to this period and go through the harvesting, feeding and release strategies. One of the key advantages of using this nursery system, as you'll see later on, we talk about numbers. It builds up numbers on your, on your farm, numbers of beetles, far, far quicker than any other method we've used in the past. The history of beetle releases in Australia is you get a, a colony of beetles for <coughs> 800 or 1,000 beetles, you release them into your paddock and you hope they you hope they go well. You will see as we talk through this that you'll potentially have tens of thousands of beetles within a couple of years. And so this system is designed around reuse. So if you put the beetles from the LZ into the PP and before you actually release all the beetles from that PP, you can take a sample of another 100 beetles and put it with your LZ and start the whole process over somewhere else. You can build as many nurseries as you like because you'll have thousands of beetles, or at least hundreds, we're not too sure, but you know, so the whole point is that you can, you get a massive field release, but from that, that becomes your breeding stock and reusing that nursery. So that's what we're trying to do, is have a system that can be self-perpetuating once you've got your head around this and can breed beetles in these nurseries, you can put them on your, on your, on, you know, other places on your property or your friend's property or whatever, and it's a reusable system. So we think it's a really good investment for that reason. Now, the management timeline for VACA, again, you're going to get your nurseries and set them up now, and then you feed them until they are not active, and then you manage the water and weeds and old dung in the nursery. However, this F1 generation comes up in January, February. Now, you've got two harvest options for vaca. You can harvest them when they come up in January, February, or you can just leave them in the soil and harvest them next year. Now, you notice I've got that one in gray and that one in black. The reason is that I have a personal preference for harvesting them then because that is giving me a measure in January or February next year, a measure of how successful that has been, the breeding has been on that site. So I, I am keen for that, um, but we've worked with plenty of farmers that, that didn't happen for whatever reason or they didn't want to, and you can harvest them next year. You'll still get a measure, but you won't, you'll get an early measure here if you like. And then the beetles that come out here, even if you've got you know, 1,500 beetles or whatever, not all of them will survive to there. So you might only get 1,200 survive or something like that if you die over that diapause period. So you're only getting the end result there of your 1200, but here you've got to measure early on. So that's up for you guys to decide. Um, happy to talk through that more if you want to. So, so again, set up, feed, manage, harvest here or here, and then it's the same process as once it's harvested to feed, release, and then reuse that nursery. So that's the broad timeline of putting together those species life cycles with the actual nursery system. So now we need to go through the details of the nursery system. And we're going to talk about locating the nurseries, where to put them, what you have to do to manage them, uh, feeding them, 
and then harvesting, and then your final releases. And also some talk about results. Now, I know Karen, you said you've got to leave at two, so we might be pushing it, we'll see how we go, but there's a lot of information in here. 215 is uh, okay. Okay, that sounds good, I'll, I'll, I'll run with that, thanks. <laughs> All right, so locating your nurseries. Now, um, probably, probably the last point is the most important point. In a location that's typical of your best pasture, we want to work out, you want to put these beetles on your pasture to bury dung. And so they should be tested in similar conditions to your pasture. So if you put them near the house, which a lot of people do because it's easy to, to get to and all that, you know, it might be, it might be a different soil type, it might be uh, you know, compacted from vehicles or all sorts of things. And so you're not getting the best measure of the beetle's performance. So whatever you do, I just encourage you to think about putting them on a site that's typical of the pasture that you want to have them on. Um, now, the, the location of the nurseries, now in particular the PP tent, so there's your SCN, there's your PP tent. The location of the nurseries need to be where you're going to be able to open them to release beetles. So you can see they're right next to the cattle here and you can open that tent and the beetles will fly out and there's dung all in there from those cattle. And so the, the, the location of the PP tent is critical that it is near where you're going to release your cattle. You can have your SZ in a different location. I think it's better in the same location because you're testing that breeding ground, but it doesn't matter so much. The critical thing is that you have your PP where the stock are going to be when you open it. So, so therefore, it needs to be central to stock rotation paddocks or cells, <clears throat> because what actually happens is that when you open the PP tent, let out the beetles, and then obviously you're going to be moving your stock into the next cell or the next paddock, and the, the beetles will fly and follow the dung. Most people follow the money, the beetles follow the dung. Um, and so it's essential to have it your location where you sort of corner of two or three paddocks or you know next to a set of cells or something like that so that as the cattle are moved to the next one the beetles can go to the next one as well what's been happening in the past when we put out our thousand beetles on the paddock and walk away and hope it goes for the best it's very different to this we're trying to concentrate the beetles in one area for breeding then we're going to try and concentrate them around that area rather than all flying over they'll fly five or six kilometers looking for food if it's close, they'll fly close, they'll stay close, the boys will find the girls, they'll be mating, and you're building up your beetle density very, very quickly. So your location is really important. Good pasture land and central to where you're going to be able to move the beetles for your, the, the, the cattle for your rotation. Central, yeah. yeah, central to some stock rotation paddocks, like near a corner post or something like near a corner assembly or something. Um, it, away from tree roots, um, tree roots can, um, can suck moisture out of the, if you had a tree near this nursery here, its roots will be sucking moisture out of that soil in summer. One of the critical things with these species is their survival in diapause over the months of January, February, March, April. Now in a lot of parts of, of, of certainly of South Australia, they're our driest months, um, not so much, as, not so much um, as dry where you guys are, but that's a time where you're wanting these broods to survive in the soil, broods and larvae and pupa. And clearly I've seen it, the tree roots can dry out that under the nursery, suck the moisture out of soil and you can have brood balls so hard I've had to crack, crack them with a pair of pliers to get them open. So away from the tree roots, um, no shade from the north because another factor that's going to affect the breeding rate is warmth. They, they clearly respond to temperature and not only does it affect the breeding rate, therefore how many broods are, are um, developed in one year, but it also affects the rate of the brood development in the soil. And so you want as many beetles to come up in, in the first year as possible. If it's cold, they will actually come up in the second year. And that's particularly happens with Bubalis. Uh, we've got some nurseries now that this year, they're two years old and in the second year, we're getting more beetles out of them in the second year than we were in the first year. So that's something to be aware of, especially with Bubalis. It can actually take up to two years to develop that full adult beetle in the soil. Um, so anything we can do to make it a bit warmer, shade from the north, uh, north facing slope, 
shelter from cold southerly winds. Um, that was going to help with the warmth of that, uh, that environment. And particularly, we're thinking about the warmth of the soil at 20 centimetres for vaca and 30 to 40 centimetres for, for bubalis. I haven't actually explained in this talk, but what actually happens is that the, beetle, the beetles take down a lump of dung into the soil, as I said, up to 30 to 40 centimetres for bubalis, depending on the soil type. In that lump of dung, they lay an egg and that egg hatches turns into a larva, which goes through several instar stages. It pupates, it turns into the adult beetle, and that's the adult beetle that comes out uh, the following year. So we're thinking about, though, what's happening underground is a brood ball, we call it, with larvae and pupae in it that we want to develop fast and we want it to survive so we don't let it dry out too much. Obviously, it's got to be fenced off so stock cannot interfere because the cattle We'll just trample this as quick as anything. Um, away from flood zones, frost hollows and rocky ground. Beetles will work done on rocky ground, but they won't lay as many brood balls. It's too hard to dig. No point getting cold spots or wet spots. Um, also, what a lot of farmers do is put their bucket of dung in their enclosure. And so they just have to ride down on the quad and put a couple of scoops in their nursery and, and ride off once they've collected their dung beforehand, of course. So that's pretty much on location. Uh, just for the sake of time, I won't spend much on assembling the nurseries, except to say that the, uh, their instructions come with each nursery kit for the LZ, P, um, SZ and for the PP336. But what I'll probably do, Karen, is email them out because that's a lot of printing, so I'll email those instructions out. Um, one, this is the sort of, these are sort of photos and that are in those instruction guides. One of the critical things is get your PP tent buried down to the soil at 10 centimetres because beetles, uh, that'll prevent beetle escape. Beetles will dig, go to the wall of the tent, they'll dig down, they might dig a little bit laterally, but they almost never dig a new hole to come up, they go up the hole that they dug down. And so the escape from this system has been negligible, if, if at all, I haven't observed it. Um, and we're certainly getting the numbers in the nurseries to indicate that it probably is not happening. Um, so this is just a precaution, get your depth. I think we got 80, 80 mils for the, um, for the, um, uh, the LZ nursery, SZ nursery, and about 100 for the PP. So I won't go into that anymore because you can read those instructions. So what we've thought about now, we've worked out where we want to locate the nursery, and we've got instructions um, how to construct it. And now I'm just going to talk about general management before we go into feeding. Um, weed control, weeds or pasture, it's probably a better way to say it, will grow up in the nurseries, clog up the zips, which is a bit of a nuisance. But more importantly, when there's 30 to 40 centimetre growth in, inside the nursery, you can't see what's going on. Um, you can't see builders walking on the ground. Um, you can't work out how much dung's being used. Um, so we basically keep it down to just below ankle, just about ankle height um, so that we can see what's going on. Also, height, if, the, if that's an enclosed enclosure with um, lots of vegetation there, your humidity builds up and you intend to get a little bit of fungal growth, which is not ideal, not detrimental to the beetles, but it's not ideal. So we like to keep the, the uh, grass growth or pasture growth down. We do it with brush cutting, obviously with the tents, here. We don't brush cut close to the edge. We hand weed the edge of those. Uh, it's fine in the in the zinc alum nurseries. Um, and it's spraying is okay. We've got research showing that 1% rate of glypho, glyphosate is not detrimental to, to beetles. And if you think about what you're doing, the beetles are in the dung or in the soil. When you put a light rate of glypho over, that goes to the outer crust of the, of the dung, which the beetles don't have contact. Mostly they don't, don't even use it, it's left there and the glypho is broke, broken down supposedly anyway with, within a few days by touching the organic matter. So there's been no reports of toxicity for a low rate of glypho and we actually recommend it where there's kaikuya or cooch. That just makes a mat in the nursery, particularly kaikuya, and you can't, you can't dig, you can't see what's going on, the beetles have got to dig through this mat. Um, and so we go back to mineral earth, it's fine. We don't use dye because in my view, and I'm a licensed spray contractor, I think the dye is more toxic than the glyphosate. 
so that's the sort of weed control management. Um, now, another thing that happens, and we'll talk about feeding rates in a minute, and most people overfeed. Um, it's not a problem. Uh, uh, it's probably it's better to overfeed than underfeed. Um, but what actually happens is that people are kind of overfeed, and we're not always understanding how much dung the beetles are using. So even if you follow a standard feeding formula, um, you know, there will be old dung that will remain in the nursery. We recommend that old dung is removed because it's a habitat for um, mites that, that uh, live off organic matter. And those mites actually um, can get onto the beetles, they do. And they use the beetles as their method of transport to go from place to place. And there's no evidence that they kill the beetles, but there is evidence that it aggravates the beetles because they've got all these mites in their joints and, um, you know, of their body portions and things like that. So removing the old dung is good for mite management. And also, it's also good for, for preventing excess dampness. If you leave old dung in a nursery, especially in a high rainfall area, you'll get a white fungus growing under the dung between the dung and the soil you've probably all seen it and that 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 fungus is not supposed to again not supposed to kill beetles but it could actually could actually add to their demise so we we, we try and remove old dung for those reasons when you do remove old dung if it's a lump of dung still stand it up at the side of the nursery to dry out before and when you're there at one feeding and then throw it out at the next feeding that means if it's standing up at the side it's got a chance for the beetles to exit the dung rather than, you know, if they were in the dung and you threw it out, you could be throwing out beetles. The timing to do these management actions is obviously when you're going to uh, um, go to feed the nursery is usually the time to do it. But in terms of time of the day, do it outside the beetle activity time. So for example, over here, it's probably gonna be pretty similar where you are, Vaca will be active flying around the nurseries on top of the dung, etc., from about 11 in the morning till 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So you do your maintenance and feeding. We actually do it, always do it before 11. We try and do it by nine, between nine and 10. So you're not going to risk opening the nursery and have the vaca flying out. Um, Bubalis, Bubalis um, late afternoon and early morning um, are their activity times. And interesting, the other day I was out there in one of the Bubalis nurseries and they're active at 3 p.m. So it can be mid to late afternoon, to early morning. So again, um, after the early morning rush, um, that nine to 11 period is a good time to do the work uh, on your Bubalis nursery as well. So feeding these nurseries. Um, so collect fresh dung, it's drench free. Now, um, we totally recommend you go to great pains to having no drench residues in the dung for these um, for these dung beetle nurseries. Yes, there's drenches around that are more dung beetle friendly than others, like Cydectin, but we don't take any chances with with this with this investment. And we get our dung the dung for our beetles from an organic dairy, and we can just go to the concrete pad and get you know three or four hundred kilograms in, a, in half an hour. Um, so that's a good way to do it if you can. Um, otherwise, you've got to get it in the paddock. Now, when you get it in the paddock, um, you, you, you'll probably notice that within minutes of a cow pad being dropped, um, you'll get other insect species fly in there. Uh, not necessarily dung beetles, there are other dung dwelling insects that live in dung and, and, and eat organic matter and that sort of thing. And you don't want a build up of other insects in your dung beetle nursery. So what we, um, what we do is we store the dung in a bucket with um, two to three millimeter holes in the lid to vent out the gases. So if you're storing the dung, it will expand a little bit. So you need to have the holes um, to let out the gases. And if you store it for a couple of weeks, um, sorry, if you store it for three to four days and it's the bucket is or tub is full of dung, basically all other insect life, pretty much all other insect life in there drowns. So we recommend kept it, keeping it and storing it for a couple of days before you use it, but you need holes in the top to let the gas out. Um, we also recommend this, that the dung is stored in the shade. I know it was in that previous picture and it'll store for a couple of weeks. It's, I believe it's not suitable when it gets a really, a real unpleasant smell. I mean, you could say dung's unpleasant anyway, but it gets an extra level of, of acrid sort of smell about it. Um, 
you know, if you store it too long, and we don't like to use that that dung, and we definitely don't freeze dung like some people do. We don't, there's lots of reasons for that, but I won't go into it now. Um, so if you're going to you're going to be getting these beetles, and you set up your nursery now, and you've collected some dung, and then you think, how much dung do I put in the nursery? That's a key question. So we get either a one kilogram or one litre, because they're about the same. Dung's about 80% moisture. A one litre uh, or a 1.5 litre saucepan or measuring scoop. And you place those scoops evenly inside the nursery. Now, this is the formula. You're getting 100 vacca in your SZ nursery. Put five one litre scoops in the nursery to start with. So that's your one litre container. And with your babalis, put seven one and a half kilogram or litre scoops for every you um, for every hundred bubalis. Or if you only had one one litre scoops, you need to put 10 in. This has been worked out on, you're dealing with two issues here in terms of density. You're dealing with beetles per square metre. And that's been worked about based upon our breeding experience here at Strathallan as to what works and what doesn't work. And you're also be dealing with beetles per kilogram of dung. Now the beetles per kilogram of dung is actually more important than beetles per square metre. The, the, the competition for, for dung, uh, if that's high, then the breeding rate is, is, is less. So if you think about what we're doing there, you know, we're putting about, um, you know, this here seven scoops, that's about 14 or 15 beetles per one and a half kilogram uh, dung station, which means you can have seven breeding pairs working in that one and a half kilogram scoop. I believe that's about the ideal because when you get, if you had, you know, 10 or 15 or 20, unfortunately the boys fight and rip each other's heads off and um, they're not busy about breeding um, and looking after their female. And so we're trying to minimize those issues. Um, the other thing that we're doing there with this, if you've got seven pairs working under a dung station, and each of those, each of those pairs digs a tunnel and makes a brood chamber in the soil down below and takes dung down, lays their eggs and everything. If you've only got a small amount of dung, they've gone to all that work to dig that uh, tunnel, make that brood chamber, and then they run out of dung. They can only do two eggs and they run out of dung, and they've got to go and find another dung pad. But if you if you've got this amount of dung, each brood, each pair can lay several, there's enough dung for each brood pair to lay several brood balls. So you're maximizing your brood production and they're not, uh, you're not, the beetles aren't spending time using up that dung, then going somewhere else and spending up the time digging more tunnels and that. So all this has been worked out as a formula. I'm not saying I've got it perfectly right, but I know we're getting good results with these formulas. So it's the best information we can give at this, at this point in time. This is daily edition, Greg. No, I'll talk about that every five to seven days. I'll go to that in a minute. Sorry. That's all right. Yeah, we'll go to that. So what we've done now is we've built the nursery and we've put we've collected the dung and we've put the dung in. And then we're going to talk about releasing the beetles, and then we're going to talk about the feeding from there on. So that's feeding, initial feeding. Then you release the beetles. Now the beetles arrive in a container with core peat. We're allowed to send uh, core peat interstate because it's sterile inert medium, which meets quarantine regulations, so it's all done legally. Um, um, Gently remove a handful of core peat with the beetles and place them next to the dung scoop, not on top. Traditionally, a lot of beetles have been released by putting them on top of the, of the, of the uh, dung pad. What happens then is the core peat falls away. The beetles, they're exposed. It sees you, it panics, it wants to fly away. So, but if you put it down by the side, it's covered in that bit of core peat and it's less likely to fly, stress and fly away. Plus, in my experience, 80 to 90 percent of the dung beetles I've released, if, I, if I've done it on top of, of the pad, they walk to the side of the pad and go into the dung pad at the side anyway. So you might as well put them down there. So put them um, in um, next to the dung, next to the dung scoops, and just repeat that till the um, all the dung scoops. So the beetles are distributed over the dung scoops you, you put in, whether it's five for vacca or seven for bubalis. Now, on to the question of how often to feed. Um, it's, it's pretty simple to remember. If you just remember five to seven, five to seven, and we'll explain that in a bit more detail. 
Feeding should be done every five to seven days, depending upon level of activity. Now you'll find, I suspect when you get the beetles from me, it's colder there than it is here. I don't think they're gonna be using their dung in five days. I think you'll find it'll be seven days or maybe a bit more. But when it starts to warm up and they start to get active and you'll see all this soil being chucked out the sides, you'll be five days, you could even be down to four. So we use that as a guide and you'll know when you go, when you go one day and there's not much dung used, you know, you know, you don't, next time you can go a day later, or if you go and it's nearly all gone, then next time you can go a day earlier. Um, so in that sort of range, five to seven. Um, now, the amount of scoops to place each time depends upon how much dung has been consumed from the start. So if two or three pads have been consumed overall, then replace two or three more scoops adjacent to the consumed dung pads. I'll explain that the significance of adjacent in a minute. So you look at that and you say, well, now I can put in seven pads and I reckon overall they're about half gone. So I'll put in three and a half more. That's the sort of formula we use. Now, at every inspection, even if there, even if you don't think there's been much dung put, used, at every inspection, put in a small scoop, whether it's half a litre or something, of fresh dung, so that the fresh dung smell is in the nursery. Because what happens if a beetle does come up from under a dung pad and it's flying around saying so wanted to find some more dung, if the dung's a few days old, it's got a crust, it's not smelly, it can fly around the nursery, it can stress, it can go to the side, it can walk around around the side, and it can die. But if there's always a bit of fresh smell in there, um, then we know that that'll be, that beetle will find that. And so we're ensuring the survival of those beetles that are getting out from under the pad. So I call that the smell scoop. The small scoop is the smell scoop. The general rule is no less than a smell scoop at any one feeding, and no more than five to seven scoops every five to seven days. So we've talked about checking on the days period, that's five to seven. The five scoops applies to VACA and the seven scoops applies to the Ibalis. Five one litres or seven 1.5. So you get that five to seven in your mind for whichever species you've got. And then you've basically got a feeding formula. Now in the hotter months, the dung will um, dry up. Um, and so you might have to do a bit more feed. There might be a little bit more wasted dung. Um, uh, so you just have to look out for that. If you've got you know, 60% of the dung left and 20% of it's dry, it's not usable dung. So that's something to watch out um, for in the hotter months. Uh, we talked about unused dung on its edge, stand on the side of the nursery, or against these have got centre posts, it's not in that picture, to let them um, beetles to escape before drying, uh, before throwing the pad out. There must always be some fresh dung inside the nursery for the activity period. Now it's different to having a little bit of fresh dung at every feed. So there's the smell, the smell feeding, all right? This is actually making sure that you're going from when you get the beetles to there's no activity for the entire activity period. Corbubalis being here in South Australia to the first week or two in January. And you've got to keep, you've got to keep feeding until you know there's no activity. And you'll see, because there'll be soil casts or you can flick up a dung pad and you'll see a new hole. So think of the whole activity period. And again, for VACA, the whole activity period, which is a little bit longer than the Bubalis because activity, because VACA has the F1 generation that comes out in December, January, and that needs to be fed in February. So that's a little bit longer. So that whole activity period concept. Now I mentioned adjacent feeding that maximizes the use of space in the nursery. So our first feeding was here, we go two, three, four, five, six, and then we just go around like that. Some people actually do it in a line and that's a really good way to efficiently use the space in the nursery. Um, it's very good because if you do it randomly, you don't know where you're at. And if you don't know where you're at, then you've not actually filled up every square centimeter of your soil with uh, brood balls. That's what you wanna do, you wanna fill it up. Um, so that's one of the main advantages of adjacent feeding. It's a systematic way to to ensure that you've covered covered the whole nursery. And what you want to get is brood balls under this one and brood balls under this one and brood balls under that one. And so you're maximizing the use of the, of the, um, of the nursery area. It's okay to feed over the same ground a second time. So you might find I've done this adjacent feeding and there's no space left. I'll bring up Greg, what, what, would it, what, what shall I do? Greg will say, if the beetles are still working, go over it again. 
you won't get over it twice <clears throat> through in the completely twice in the, in the season, I don't believe. But if you think about that, what's happening? So the broods are under this dung, dung pad number one here, and now you've got to put a, um, another dung pad on it or near it. And the beetles will, the beetles will dig into that soil and make more broods. And sometimes they will come across a brood from the previous pair and they will dig straight through that brood and they will destroy that brood and so you're getting a loss there, but, but in essence, you're getting more broods being made by the pair on that same location than what you're getting lost. Now, it's not, it's not ideal, you know, um, and it's not worth going to a bigger nursery because going over twice doesn't happen all that much, um, but it's okay to do it if you've got a lot of activity, you're unsure where the dung is, just go over it again. And you, what you're doing in essence, you might be destroying a few brood balls, but you're putting a lot more in there. And don't panic if you're a day late with feeding and all the dung is gone. Um, if you think about these beetles, they, we just said they had four or five months in diapause. Uh, yeah, the whole system is shutting down, but I've done starvation trials and with both Thacker and Bubalis, storing them at room temperature at 25 degrees, which it wouldn't be in the soil, um, mostly be a lot lower than that. But at room temperature, 25 degrees, both species take about three days before any, any beetle will die. And the reason I did that starvation trial is because I wanted to understand the limitations of freighting the beetles, how many days got to have them in freight uh, before they start to die. And so that's why we use overnight freight. We have dispatch, we always dispatch on a Tuesday and it's 24 hour service. And pretty much um, the, the, the freight guy comes here between 12 and 1 p.m. on a Tuesday. And pretty much most people have their beetles in their hands before 12 o'clock the next day. In Eastern Australia from Strathalbyn. So it's a really, really good service. So you're going to get them in within one day. Yes, we clean them out the day before or the morning that morning. So they've got one and a half days without food. So they might have one and a half to two days without food before they get to you, but three days pretty much before you'll get any death. So what I'm saying, don't panic if you go there, it's out of dung. The beetles are going to survive in the soil for a couple of days, probably a lot longer, especially in the soil because it's a lot cooler than 25 degrees. Now, this one is, gets a little bit complex. We talked about the F1 VACA that comes out in December, January. Now, whether you harvest that beetle and put it in your PP tent then, or whether you leave it in the LZ, then in both situations, you still have to feed it for that period of time. Now, the, the F1 beetles are evidenced by the dung use looking very, very different. So when beetles are breeding, they'll cast out soil here by the side of the dung pad so that they're making room in the soil for their tunnels and their, and their brood chambers. F1 beetles are not breeding, so they don't dig deep. They actually only live about, about um, 50 to, to 100 mil, no, sorry, yeah, 50 to 100 mil, uh, if that actually, below the dung pad. Um, they, what they do is they, they, they go into the dung pad and they eat the dung and then they have a little tunnel directly under where they're eating in the dung. Uh, and then they'll come up and eat in the dung, and then they'll go down into the tunnel. So they're surviving in those top couple of inches of, of, of soil. And so <clears throat> what they're doing is they're not taking the dung down, they're sucking the moisture out of the dung as it is there on the surface and therefore, when you, you'll know when F1 beetles are active because instead of the dung being buried, it looks like it's been shredded. This is a no shredded dung there, fresh dung pad. Then that's been partially shredded. The moisture has been sucked out of that dung and that's a completely shredded dung pad. It's dry fibers that you can pick up with your hand. So when you start to see shredding in a, in a, in a dung pad, then you know that's a key sign telling you that the new generation of beetles is out. It's not just the parents using the dung, it's the young ones as well. Another thing you can do with this, because, fine, that's fine. because I said there's a lot of, lot of tunnels you can have, I recommend, I think you'll get 80 to 100 beetles per kilogram of dung um, under, under one dung pad. And you can lift that dung pad up and you'll see 80 to 100 holes. If you see 80 to 100 holes, and not 
four or five, you know that that's in the in the F1 are now active, not the parents breeding. So when you get to this point with the F1s, whether you're feeding them in the existing LZ nursery or you move them to the PP, the formula we use is about 80 beetles. It's, it's only relevant to vacca. 80 beetles per kilogram of dung or 120 beetles per one and a half kilograms. Those F1 beetles will feed for two to three weeks. We've measured this. Um, and so you have to feed the F1, F1 beetles two to three weeks after the last beetles are being put in your PP tent. In other words, until shredding stops. So your F1 beetles, some of them might come out in the first week of January. Some might come out in the first week of February. So you have to feed until two to three weeks after the last emergence of your F1 beetles. It sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot in terms of you only dealing with a few kilograms of dung each time. It actually is not a lot of work. It's more just being tuned into what's happening and doing it at the right time. So we've, we've gone through now setting up the nursery, putting the dung in there, putting the beetles in there and feeding them. And now we've got to think about the harvesting of them. And so we're talking about December, January for Vacker F1, or we're talking about next spring for both the Vacker and Vibalis. We've already talked about the summer harvest with F1 Vacker. Um, start when shredding starts, start your harvest when shredding starts. So we've mentioned that. Now the spring harvest um, for the following year, pretty much from August onwards here in South Australia. And again, you'll work out your own time, but I still recommend you do it from August on to start with. In each nursery, so you haven't been feeding this, you haven't been feeding it February, March, April, May, June, July, but in August, put about two, one and a half litre dung stations for every nursery, every four to five days. What you're doing there is you're putting some dung in the nurseries so that if some beetles come out, or they come out earlier than you expected, they have got a food source and so they won't die. But then also they'll start working that food source and they'll be able to tell that they're out because of the activity in the dung. So these are just like four tastes really, just a little bit of dung so they don't die and then to tell you what's going on. So you do those two scoops of dung and then you look for activity in the nursery, which will be uh, again, soil being cast out or flicking up and seeing if there's a few holes underneath. When it is obvious that there are more than two or three beetles active in your nursery, that's when you can start the trapping program. So this slide here is really about when to harvest. Shredding for F1s and soil casts and uh, holes for uh, the, the, the spring harvest the following year. What you need for harvesting, uh, we need the trapping tray, which is, comes with the nursery. This has got holes small enough that backer don't actually get through it. And you'll see how that's working in a minute. Ideally, if you can get a three to four millimeter sieve for vacca, um, because you can, sieve, you're gonna put soil in the tray and have soil and beetles in there. And if you can sieve out the soil, it's a whole lot easier than picking them out, especially with vacca, because they're small. Um, and a six to eight miller, millimeter sieve for bubalis. It's, it's not easy to get a three to four millimeter sieve, and it could be 70 or 80 bucks. Uh, you get them from, we get them from Arbor Green, a, a, a sort of a seed supplier, treescape sort of supplier organization. The six to eight millimeter sieves are eight or nine dollars from Bunnings or a hardware store. They're very easy to get and they're perfect for Bubalis. You also need some, some sand or we use coarse sand uh, for our trap uh, because it does not clump and it's easy to sieve. And you need a container with some holes in it to put the beetles in um, when you harvest. Any soil or sand will work. Um, it's just that some of them are a bit gluggier and harder to work and they're harder to get through the sieve. Um, so you can use anything you've got, but we find we've got this coarse sand which flows fairly freely and that's good for harvest. Now, so to harvest you... Oh. Sorry, let's get rid of that phone call. <laughs> um, for harvesting... Um, Remove old dung crusts from your nursery um, and then dig out in the soil in the middle of the nursery the shape of the tray. So you can see that's been dug out there. We usually just dig it out a bit, then trip the, flip the tray upside down and just scoop by the tray and that just gets the size of the tray. Place the tray in the hole 
making sure that the soil is level with the top of the tray. So here, the soil has got to be level with the top of the tray. And the reason for that is, in my view, 90% of, of the beetles will come in from the side. And if there's a, a lip there, they'll, they'll walk along the soil, hit that lip of the tray and they'll walk around the tray. And so we make it easier, they just go over the lip and straight into the dung that's, here's the dung in the tray here. So make sure the, um, um, it's level, the, the tray sides are level with the soil. Uh, fill it with your, so that's a tray in the soil, level with the soil. Fill it with your um, coarse sand or soil, a damp but not too wet, and put about half a litre of dung on there. Now, I deliberately put this photo in to point out it's too much dung. You, when you harvest, you're going to the most get 40 or 50 beetles every few days, and it builds up over time. And that's one of the reasons we use the PP tents, because you're putting 40, 50 beetles in at every harvest, and you build up to get a large number of beetles, then you'll release them at one time. That's another advantage of the PP tent. But if you put a big lump of dung like this here, um, then next time you want to put a bit of fresh dung or the smell dung there, and before long, your whole pad is full of dung. Half a litre of dung will keep 40 or 50 beetles alive for a long time. And then, and then when you've done a harvest, you put that half litre, you take it off to get the sand out, you put it back on and you put a bit of fresh dung so you can basically have four or five harvests before you actually get too much dung there um, that you've built up dry dung and old dung. And at that, when it gets to that point, you've got to actually wash the, wash the beetles out of the dung. You put the beetles and the dung in the bucket, twist the bucket around pretty swiftly and the beetles will float to the surface and you've got to do that fairly quickly otherwise, otherwise they drown. So to avoid having to wash out, just start with half a litre of dung on top and that'll give you a more harvest before you have to wash out. See, I was saying trap every three to five days and that's exactly what we're doing at the moment. I'm trapping twice a week, once is three days apart and once is four days apart. Daily, if numbers are high, we've definitely had times with vaca that we harvested, we get 100 to 120 beetles a day and we harvest um, harvest every day. You'll see, if that's happening, you'll see and you'll just revert to a daily harvest. So any remaining fresh dung that's in the enclosure should be placed on the trap. So when you've set your trap, don't leave any other dung around there because the beetles will go to that and work under that and they won't go to your trap. Um, so emptying the trap, basically the dung that's on top, you remove it. Here's some dung being removed, although it's fairly dry. Um, we recommend using disposable gloves. Um, Remove the dung in the low activity times of the, of the day, which we, we spoke about before, the, the main period being say nine to 11 in the morning. Um, um, and another advantage of that is that the beetles can actually be in the dung. See here, they're in the dung here. If you do it early, they won't even be in the dung. So not only you risk them flying away if you do it in activity time, you also re re risk a lot more beetles actually being in the dung and you can't get as many in the sand. Uh, if you must act, harvest when activity is high, then use a watering can or something over the surface of the entire closure because any beetles that come up while that the nursery is open, they can fly away. But if you just wet up the nursery, that uh, wets them up and they just won't, they won't fly away. So emptying the trap. So we've taken the dung off and replaced the sand from the trap into the sieve and put the tray back into the insert in the soil. Then put the sieve the sand over the tray so the sand is sieved back into the tray to minimise waste. If you don't have a sieve, you'd have to carefully pick out the beetles by hand. Um, this is fine with Bubalis, but it's a bit of a tall order with vacca. It's very, very easy to miss vacca in, in, that, in that sort of um, soil there or that sort of sand. Um, and if the, dung become, the sand becomes too wet from, from the dung or from a rain, um, you know, it's best to replace it with fresh sand. So if it gets really soggy and damp and gluggy and, you know, um, just, just got to be damp, not wet. So it's best to replace it every, well, every four or five harvests or when it gets too wet. So emptying the trap, um, if the soil or sand is hard to sieve, you can actually use a watering can or hose to wash the sand or the soil through the sieve. And that also slows down the activity, as we said. That's very useful. We take watering cans out into the field a lot. Once the soil or sand has been separated, you can easily pick out the beetles. You count them and place them in your plastic tub. If you find any other beetle species in, the, in your nursery at that time, discard them. And then when you've got some debris from your sieving operation, 
again with vaca there's stones larger stones in there and you could mistake um, a vaca for a stone so we usually put that debris back in the nursery as well just in case there's an um, odd beetle in it and so you've sieved everything out and here's a tray that's been sieved out and now you can pick out the vaca beetles and count them with the avalus there's another option here this was done in soil you literally just flip the tray over and you can see the beetles there and the channels where they've been digging in the soil they will mostly be at the bottom of the tray and it makes it really easy just to pick them out because they've got quite a big beetle although you shouldn't just think they're all at the bottom you still should sift through the soil so um, that's how you collect your beetles um, now resetting your trap you may have to top up the sand in the trap um, make sure you put the dung that you removed um, be before you took out the tray make sure you put that back on the trap as well as fresh dung for the smell factor. Um, and when the dung on the trap builds up or there's lots of dry dung on the trap, it's time to wash out the trap uh, and to look for beetles in that washed out um, dung. You've heard that call too, <laughs> um, which we talked about. And then go back to your soil, make sure your soil is that level at the top again. That's resetting the trap. Now, Sometimes, especially with vaca, if there's a lot of beetles in the trap, and especially if you get a contaminant beetle, like if they come out in summer and you've got a bit of uh, taurus, species called taurus, in, in with the feeding dung, the taurus will create a competition factor in your trap and the vaca will stress and they will fly to the sides of the nursery. And then, so we actually do check down at the sides of the nursery, particularly for vaca. And, and, and particularly if you've got other species in your dung. So if you're harvesting 80 to 100 species of beetles of vaca every day, or if you've got another species uh, like Taurus in your trap, they're the two indicators to tell you that vaca is likely to be stressing. They fly to the side of the trap and, they, and then you dig down the side of the trap like we have done there, and you'll find you can get often 40 or 50 more beetles. Um, for, for Bubalis, it's not so critical but just check if there's any tunnels near the side of the trap because they'll dig down. They're pretty obvious because they make a big, a big tunnel. So just check around the side of your trap for both species for any other beetles. Because that we, we had one farmer and he said he wasn't getting many and we went to his farm and he had literally thousands of taurus and we literally dug down the side of his trap and got several hundred beetles. It's rare, but it's something to be aware of. Okay, not always necessary, but something to be aware of. So that's the trapping and resetting the trap and all that sort of information. Now you've got your beetles, um, you've placed them in your plastic tub. Um, always have your plastic tub in the shade during your harvesting activities. And we said there should be holes in the top of the tub. Beetles should not remain in the plastic tub for longer than 30 minutes unless there is a medium in the container such as a cool soil or core peat. All right, because and even if there's a large number of beetles, you get hundreds of beetles in here, they stress, they're crawling over each other, they're fighting over each other. It's getting hot getting hot in the tub. Um, so oh, yeah, it's just looking after the beetle um, till you put them where you want to put them. And next, next. Um, so you've harvested beetles and then as we've said, we want to put them into the PP tent. We've grown them in the, in the OZ, OZ nurseries. We put them in the P tent, which is going to be our release tent. Just for your sake, Karen, we're only still about five minutes away. I'm hoping not making you too late, um, but yeah. Um, so that's that's what we do now. Let's have a think about the numbers that we can be expecting here. You're getting 100 beetles um, in your SZ nursery, and I've set I've done an estimate there. You get a tenfold in, increase in beetles, uh, which means by January that's wrong. Not 2021. It's 2022. There's an extra one there. Um, by that by that um, January, you could have you, if you've got a tenfold increase, you'd have a thousand beetles. If that thousand beetles breeds well in the PP tent, then by the time it's finished in the PP tent breeding by October, December 2022, you could have up to 10,000 broods that will survive in that tent. This is why one of the reasons it's a whole lot better than buying 800 to 1,000 beetles, because within 18 months, you've potentially got 10,000 beetles that will come out and You've got them all in one location so you can have a dense uh, high density release of beetles. Now, you'll ask, will I get tenfold? 
Well, our work here on the Flora Peninsula, we have got on farms in our nurseries here, we've had over 20 fold. On farms, we've we've had, well, we've had right down to, to, to only getting 100 beetles back, but that's a failure. That's telling you that site's not suitable. But on sites that are suitable for VACA, we are getting from seven to 15.3 fold increase. So again, if you had 15 fold increase and you get that over those two breeding systems, then in the second year, you're over 20,000 beetles. So I think 10 fold is a reasonable um, estimate to work on for, for VACA. For Bubalis uh, with the 100 beetles, um, we haven't done as much work on, on Bubalis. We definitely have got 5.6 fold on farms, but we have also had some problems with brood survival in South Australia because we have next to no rainfall in February, March, April, which you guys have a lot more. So I'm expecting your survival through that period will be better than here in the drier uh, South Australian climate. And I don't think it's unreasonable to expect a six fold increase. So that means you have 600 beetles harvest next spring going into your uh, PP tent. And if they produce at another six fold increase, then by the following end of the next breeding season, you've got 3,600 broods. Um, oops, what happened there? Um, there's 10,000 vaca and 3,600 broods. You might think you're getting ripped off with the bibalis. You're not. They're a much, much bigger beetle and they'll bury more than twice the amount of dung as vaca. So it's very equivalent in terms of the dung that is used. If you think about what we did with our field releases, we used to get 800 to 1,000 beetles. Um, and really to, to meet that method, to meet the, the, the same criteria as, as past methodology, you've only got to get 800 to 1,000 surviving broods to meet that criteria. And also the price of a colony of beetles is pretty much the same price as the colony of our nursery kit with beetles. So you're paying about the same price. Yes, you've got a bit of work to do, but you should easily exceed that target and you've got a system that can go on year after year after year. So that's a 800 to a minimum is, is, is a minimum target. Now, think about these PP tents again, it's important to go through this thinking. So we're putting the beetles into the PP tent either in January or in spring when we've harvested them. In the spring that we put them in there, we feed them till all the soil in that tent is worked. So we do adjacent feeding until the whole thing has been worked. And that's probably only two to four weeks, depending upon the number of beetles you get in there. So when all the soil has worked, you're now ready to open that tent to release the beetles. But before you open the tent, make sure cattle are contained around the tent, around the PP tent, by either with a hot wire or it's in a cell grazing system, or put a bale of hay near the tent. So the cattle are coming up, eating the hay and they're pooing on the ground. And so there's there's poo all around. So what, you've done, what you're doing here is that you're filling up that tent with brood balls and then you're putting cattle around the tent so that you want to, when you open the tent, you're going to fill up all the soil around the tent with the brood balls. So when you've got that system of cattle around the tent in place, then you open the tent and allow the beetles to escape. And they'll go and work that dung that is around the tent. After all the beetles have gone, then you close the tent. It might take a week or so, or you can just check if there's any activity, any extra bearing. Um, you close the tent. Now, what's happened, you're closing the tent, you have trapped in that soil, um, the breeding that, that of all those beetles in there, that soil will be full of beetles. That soil is 3.36 square meters in a PP tent. That's bigger than by far the SZ and a bit bigger than the LZ. You'll have more beetles trapped in the soil than you had in your original nursery. And that is your source for your stock for next year. So all these beetles, they'll be establishing in, around the nursery. Next year, the following spring, you feed that tent again till it's worked. And then you open the tent and you can have another release. So you can simply have another release in the same area. So if you released it, you know, 4,000 beetles that year, you can release 4,000 next year as well. Or before you open it to release the beetles, harvest a few beetles from there and take that with your SZ, LZ nursery and start another nursery somewhere else. So the PP tent concept is a very, very important concept for, for replicating releases 
and for the seed stock for future nurseries. I think this is my last slide. We talked about our minimum target is 800 to 1,000 beetles. Um, we started with 100 beetles. So again, if we got um, six-fold increase with your barless, you're talking about 3,600, or 12-fold with uh, vaca, 14,000. In the past, we were using 50 beetles per nursery for bubalis. We've gone away from that because we're just not starting with enough to get the numbers um, of beetles we want in one year or in 18 months. Um, that would be your minimum target is if you did have 50, 200 beetles, and then you'll get 800 as your minimum target. So you can see here, if you've got 100 beetles, the minimum target is, is if you've got fourfold, then you're actually exceeding the minimum target. This is the reason for talking about this, it's important to look at this number. When you, you start with 100 beetles, when you're harvesting the next spring, you think, well, I've got 100, I've got 200, I've got 300, I've got 700 beetles, what's good? Well, basically, if you look at this, if I've harvested 400, it's really good. If I've harvested 800, it's like fantastic. So that spring harvest is going to tell you a lot about the success of that beetle on that site and what that likely success is going to be in the following year. Um, yeah, so we say as a minimum 200 beetles um, is what you need before you open the PP tent. Anything below two, 200, 200 beetles, we need to, if you did have poor results, you had below 200 beetles, then it may be that that, that site is not suitable for the species. I don't believe that's the case where we're going with, with you, with your sites, but that's something to think about. It's either not suitable or something has gone wrong. Like one farmer rang me up and said, oh, I accidentally left the, the nursery lid open for a couple of days. Is that going to be a problem? Yes, it is. So if you don't get those sort of numbers, <laughs> it's happening. That's it, folks. I'll, I'll, do, I'll stop sharing. And I'm not sure if you've got any time now, Karen, for questions. Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes and I've already got a couple of questions. So I'll reel them off first and then I'll um, hopefully we'll still have time just to check if anybody yeah. else does. If we're starting to run low on time, people can email the questions to either me or you. I'll yeah. give everybody your um, email address afterwards um, and yeah. do some follow up. And certainly Greg's available for everybody if you've got questions as you're setting the nurseries up. All right, yeah. so I'm just going to go through the couple of questions that are in the chat. Um, so David wants to know, um, avoiding a flood zone, does that include areas that are wet and boggy in winter? Yes, it does. Um, yes. If you, basically, both these species grow, they do well in the 1,000 to 1,200 mil rainfall zones in France where the soil is well drained. If you've got, it doesn't mind dampness, but it doesn't want waterlogging. So if you know where there's a wet area, just make sure it's a bit up slope that it gets wet and boggy. They will, they will actually suffocate from lack of oxygen and also get fungal disease if it's too wet. So high rainfall is fine, but they're definitely not wet and boggy. Cool. Um, yeah. And also just what rate of roundup? Is that per label just, or do you have a set rate? Uh, it's per label, which is 1%. So, you know, one litre per 100, one litre per 100 litres of water or we'll scale that down. Yeah. Down and a uh, question from Jane, can you use horse manure? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, and I obviously there's a bit of hesitant in my voice with that. Um, I haven't worked with horse manure myself. Um, I know Dr. Bernard Doe has, and he says that that um, bubalis will work with horse dung. I don't know about vaca with horse dung. Um, I do think I do know there's a a lot of people have had success with vaca on sheep dung, which is um, a bit hard to collect. Um, but if somebody wanted to grow their beetles with purely horse dung, I, my, my thinking is that you, you'll be pleasantly surprised. I think you'll get quite a good result, uh, but I don't have as much confidence with horse dung as I do with using cattle dung. Awesome, thank you. Uh, just another one from David. During the hotter months, um, where can you get more fresh dung? <laughs> Borrow from your neighbours? <laughs> well, if you can find a dairy, it's great. Um, it is actually becomes quite hard because you've really got to go out, you know, you know, first thing when the cows drop in the dung, you've got to go out early in the morning before it gets too, too dry. I mean, that is, that is a problem. Yeah. What about goats? Oh. Will they? Oh, I've done no work with goats. goats. Oh, I, I so there happens to be a goat dairy down that way. So I just kind of wondered if yeah, you I, I, skip up the goats. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't try goats, to be honest. I, I think it'd be a risk. For me, it'd be a risk for, for these nurseries with goats, yeah. No, I don't know of any work that's been done with them. Awesome. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right, so they're the questions that are in the chat. So uh, I'll open it up now for a couple of minutes. Does anybody else have any particular questions? Um, you can either put them in the chat and type them and I'll read them out or just um, start, we'll all start speaking over the top of each other to get our questions in or put your hand up if you know how to use that function in the online uh, session. So anybody else have a question? Yes, I do, Diana. Um, just if you've drenched cattle, how long will the drench be in the dung after you've drenched them? Is it, is it just a month or so, do you know? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I don't know if you've got Dr. Bernard Dobe's book, Dung Down Under, I just held up there. I, I totally recommend it if you're working with dung beetles. And he has done a lot of work with trenches and he has got guidelines in here and it's a worry, it's a real worry, uh, especially with the mectins. It says here, I'm quoting now, half of the dose in the, do in the dung is gone after several months. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, it's a bit of a worry, but again, it depends on toxicity. So you've got Cydectin, it's unlikely to affect the beetles at all, but because I'm doing breeding in a nursery, I, I, would, I would only, I would wait a month after using Cydectin, just to be sure. But if you got any of the other other mectins, they're called. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'd be waiting a couple of months. Oh, I'm literally am waiting a couple of months. That our organic dairy that we went we go to, drenched with ivermectin, and obviously they're not organic anymore. And so we're not going. We're going to another organic dairy, and we're not going to go to that other dairy for at least two months, based mm -hmm. upon this data. And, and it's always that niggle, you know like how long is it going to last it's always that niggle if you're investing all this in the nursery do you want to risk it um, um you know and then of course it depends a lot on the drench for example again in bernard's book he's got them all here you know there's some of the some of the drenches are um, excreted in the urine not the feces and so they're obviously less toxic um you know so yeah it's really a matter of just working through these tables looking at the drench you're using and saying, look, you know, if I'm going to use a mectin, it could be a couple of months. Mm. Um, yeah, and I can't give any better than that. I really, it, it's a thing that really worries me. I don't worry so much once the once the beetles are established in the field, um, mm. because you've got, you know, if you think about, it, you're going to have thousands of beetles, and if you drench, if there's a bit of residue when they're in the field, um, it's going to kill, you know, the beetles over that next week or two, but it's not going to kill the beetles for the whole season. You might knock the population back to 80% or something like that, but when you're investing everything in 100 beetles in a nursery, I think we've got to make it a low risk situation. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. We, yes, we used Sidectin and we, oh, okay. we, drenched, we drenched in early, uh, very early, uh, mid June, I think June. it was mid June. Oh, yeah, I think it'd be fine. I, I would be confident. I would be happy to do that myself. All right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm zero risk when it comes to drenches. <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we leave them in the paddock for about a week before we take them out to the next spot, and they don't go back to that paddock for a long time. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. No worries. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and just on, I guess, on the drenches um, and that sort of thing, we've um, trying to organise at the moment for Russ Barrow, so the Dung Beetle Ecosystem Engineers yeah. Project in New South Wales. We're trying to get them to come down and do the next round of workshops. Well, the plan was for October. I don't know how well we're going to go given the situation in New South yep. Wales and here in Victoria, but we certainly got it on the cards. And um, David, who's on the call today, you know, we, I'll be working with the VFF on the peninsula um, to at least run one of those workshops down there. And Agriculture Victoria have also said they'll come along and do uh, like a drenching best practice nice. session as nice. well. So we're sort of looking at some of those things in the coming months as well. So I know we did do a workshop up in Macedon earlier this year, which is what kind of started all of this, but we didn't really focus as much on the drenching aspect. So we might have to do something with, um, I mean, we may even go online if we have to, uh, so that everybody can join, but we're certainly going to bring in some of the drenching um, expertise with vets and Agriculture mm -hmm. Victoria as well to help us out with that. So they're certainly the things that we're planning to do in the next couple of months when we can move around a bit more, hopefully. Just to clarify so, the drench issue, um, we do February calving uh, and we sell the calves for killing in December each year. So late August each year, I give the calves a drench to give them a good kick into spring so that they've got no worm burden to, so they can put on a full 
lot of weight gain. Yeah. So an August trench is coinciding now with where we're trying to get the nursery established. So um, ideally not have them in the same paddock as the nursery then after they've had the drench. Is that the idea? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you're only doing the calves, can you have some of the older stock separate where you don't have to drench and get the dung from them? Uh, no, well, they, they, they I run them all as one mob. All as one mob, okay, yeah. Mm. Um, to, so, so as to maximise the rotational grazing. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't be using that dung. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you're not actually drenching the cows, are you? Just the calves. Just the calves. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the cow drench should be, the cow dung should be drenched free, whether you can separate that or, or, or collect that separately. Or the bigger pads. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah be, be a risk. You, you know, you could try it. I mean, other than that, it is a problem with dung beetles, you know. I mean, yeah, other than that, you get the drench from somewhere else. I mean, on the other hand here, you know, what we're doing, we've actually got farmers now with, with dung beetles burying the dung all year and interrupting the life cycle, a lot of parasites and actually drench free. So we've just got to take that step to, <laughs> to work towards that if we can. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure, yeah. David, you'd have to think of something there to try and get some drench free dung. Yep, thank you. Awesome. Um, any other questions? Like I said, if we're running out of time, we can, um, Greg will have his email address for everybody to have access to. I will also make this Greg? recording available. It takes me about two hours to download it. Was that a question? Yeah, Greg, can you hear me? Um, Marcus, yeah. It's Marcus yeah. here, Marcus O'Reilly. Say you were going away for more than the five to seven days. Can you yep. sort of load up and keep a especially damp set of pads to go in to just tide you over for, say, 10 days? Would that be Absolutely. feasible? Absolutely, totally. Mm. Yeah. Yep. If you load it up, they'll find it. That's fine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, can I can I ask if people do email me a question? Can you just email me which group that you're with? Because I get people saying, "Oh, it's David here or someone." <laughs> I don't know where they're from. So just say which program you're a part of, so I, I can zone in on on who I'm talking to. Thank you. Yeah. Easy. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. It'll take me a couple of oh. hours to download this recording. No, thank you. And um, then it will be available. We are. I am trying to put together a, a quick reference guide as well with um, Greg's information. I've just got to send it to Greg just to fact check some of my things in there. Okay. So I've tried to do a bit of a two pager so that you know instead of having to watch a, an hour video and find the right yeah. bit, if you've just got a quick question to check, cross check something, I'm kind of trying to do that quick reference guide. So I'm in the process of putting that together for everybody as well. Um, and with three and species, Aaron, I've got to have three different bits on it. So um, and Aaron, just, the, the instruction, Karen, the instruction manual. Yep. Does that include stuff we've been uh, watching on this PowerPoint? Uh, there, yes, it does. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I've screen saved some of us. Okay. I've done screenshots of some of us. Yep. That'll be in the instruction manual anyway, will it? It will, yeah. So it's just a quick reference guide. So I've taken out some of the key points, particularly around um, you know how much dung, what to use, when to do it, how to how to quickly ma um, maintain maintain it, when to harvest. Those sort of quick reference things I've taken out. So hopefully, if there's stuff that's missing and you want in the reference guide, I can add it. So I'm just trying to keep it short and sharp for everybody, so you've got that quick page flick to um, check something. But um, I can make it as extensive as you want. It's just um, trying to make it a bit easier. Thank you. Um, yep, and the I was, I was going to say, say the, we're in the process yeah. of doing a complete manual for this. Great, complete yeah. detailed manual. So, yeah. Yep. yep. If anybody wants it too, well, I've got it here. I don't know if you can see it. This book here is my dung beetle book. I'm happy to send everybody the link, which you can get yes. through CSIRO. So, I think it's, uh, I can't remember how much it is. It's $20 or something like that. Um, but it's got all the different species of dung beetles. So, if you want to have a quick reference guide for looking at in the paddocks as well, it's Pretty handy. That's what I've been using every time you all send me your photos. I um, look them up in this book to, to see which one it's likely to be if I don't recognize it. Um, so that, I think that's pretty much everything. The instruction book for the actual nursery kit construction um, will come out through from Greg as well in the next few days. And I'll let you know as soon as the nurseries have been couriered from South Australia. So you'll know that the actual uh, nursery kits are on their way. They usually take about 24 hours as well. And then um, we're on track to have the beetles the week after. So you'll have a good week to put your kits together um, before you need to um, put the beetles in there. So that gives you a week for the kits and also to gather your first load of dung as well.
Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. Very and much. Um, yes, mm. I will um, send you all this link and the, all the information you need ready for the uh, dung beetles in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Right. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks no drama. Much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Karen.